Hello everybody, welcome to Cup of Chai. Today is October 9th, 2020. Uh, I have with me Rajep and Awesome. Hello guys. Hi Jonah. What's up? Hey Jonah. How's everything guys? It's good. How about you? Yeah, uh, school. They're really pushing us. And we're coming close to the midterm, so... Yeah, what classes are you taking? CS? I'm, I taking, heard you... I'm taking three CS courses, one Anthropology and one Calc. Oof, that must be rough. Good luck. <laughs> so, Rajeb is our special guest for today. Um, it's great to have you, Rajeb. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be on here. Thanks for inviting me again. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Rajeb, we're going to be talking about the new Netflix uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma. Yeah, uh, I watched yeah. that last week, actually. It was really the, interesting. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I highly recommend everyone to go watch that. <clears throat> but before that, we're going to be with Awesome. So, Awesome, uh, what are you going to be talking to us about today? Hi, Jonah. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to be talking about basketball. The reason I'm sa- I'm saying unfortunately is because two of my favorite teams, Denver and Boston, were eliminated in conference finals. So we were left to watch Lakers and Miami. Um, I can't deny two of the games were really, really close and fun, especially game four. It was uh, really an uh, amazing game. But to be honest, I can't watch it objectively because I still cannot accept that Miami team eliminated my Boston. Uh, they, do, you, do you think it was well-deserved or no? I mean, they deserved it. I cannot say that they did not deserve Any team who goes to NBA Finals, it, it's really impossible to say that they did not deserve it. But they definitely pulled a rabbit from hat in every game. The first two games, it was Goran Dragic and Tyler Hero. He goes for 37 and just destroyed the game four. They were up 3-1. We still managed to come back to 3-2 and end in game six. In halfway through the last quarter, we were, we were up by six. But then Boston just collapsed. It, was, it really hurt me. I, I should say some good things about Bam Adebayo. Um, he was my most improved player uh, nominee for for beginning of the season, but I wasn't expecting this much. He was clearly the best player on Eastern Conference Finals, so I'm really glad to see him <laughs> becoming a, such a good player. But I wish it wasn't against my Boston. What um, what do you think was the biggest reason for Boston's downfall? Was it the coaching, the players, um, the teamwork, or what? Tyler Hero. I'm um, just Tyler Hero. He's a rookie, but he plays like a 10 year veteran. Mm-hmm. So he made the leap during the conference semifinals, I guess. I can say during Miami series, he made a couple of big shots. But um, overall, as I said, in each game, I listened from some other podcast- podcasters too. Boston was the better team, but when it mattered most, Miami somehow find the ways to get ahead of Boston. Um, as it's been like maybe a week or so, but I still cannot accept it. Sometimes I think about all the matchups, what went wrong and stuff, and it just depresses me. I was really high on Boston this season because I I thought that this was a very good chance for them to uh, win it all. Also, I wanted to see a Lakers Boston. You know. Boston has the most titles and Lakers has the second most titles in the NBA. So, and it's always fun to watch those two teams go against each other. But here we are. So, actually, in like in an hour, I guess uh, the game five will start and Lakers up three one, and they may win it all tonight, or maybe Miami can force game six or game seven then win it all. I don't. Um, I I'll. I think Lakers will win it tonight, but I wouldn't count Miami out because they somehow always find ways to keep them going. Uh, they got extra from their role players, so I really respect them. And I need to say, uh, sometimes 
their coach Eric Spolstra is overlooked uh, because you know in 2011 and to 2014 you know LeBron Wade Bosch some very good players but he he's really one of the best coaches in the NBA he knows what to get what to get the best of each player so he maximized this uh, Miami team because when you look at individually these players some these players have some obvious weaknesses but he somehow blends a good um he somehow blends his rotations so none of these weaknesses are can take advantage from the other teams so really shout out to him um to be honest i did not enjoy this nba finals a lot because while i was watching all i could have think was how boston were eliminated man i don't know uh i feel like Lakers is just going to end it all tonight. LeBron is he's determined, man. Yeah, definitely. You know, we saw in uh, game 5 against Denver, he started game amazing and when you know, you, you know Denver always comes back somehow even they're down 15 17 doesn't yeah. matter. They even they came back, but in the fourth quarter, just, LeBron just said, "Okay, I'm going to finish it tonight. I'm not going to give them chance to come back." Uh because you know the Denver came back from two, three, one uh, deficits, so he cr- he clearly didn't want them to give any life, any hope, and he finished them off. I expect him to be as determined as that game, um, and just uh, every a- NBA fan just sit back and enjoy LeBron as now we can because. It's it's really unbelievable. He's 36 years old and still the best player in the NBA, like the 17 years. It's crazy. Just enjoy it. I cannot understand people who hate on LeBron. I don't know why. I, I guess I can understand the first half of his career was he was not real liked, but after he came to Cleveland, I think he he just went to an, another level and it was over, you know, childish hatred. Just enjoy him. You- That's all I can say. Do you think there's going to be like a LeBron mentality, just like how there was a Mamba mentality for Kobe, like later on in the future? Um, to be honest, I don't think so because they were two different players, and I don't know if there will be a LeBron mentality because he's a he's a very unique player. You know, Kobe was straight killer. He was the edge of the spear. You know, he was piercing everything, but. LeBron is more of the body of the spear, you know? Uh, it doesn't mean he's less important or like, but uh, some players have more charisma in them, and Kobe was definitely one of the best. That doesn't mean LeBron is not that uh, LeBron is not good or anything like that. It's just two different very uh, two very different styles of basketball. Yeah, I definitely agree. We just have to enjoy the greatness in each basketball player because like at the end they're going to retire. And we're not going to be able to see any more plays or any more games involving them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree with you. We should enjoy them as when we can. Um, because one day... Also, uh, one of the things that I don't understand, I don't know why you don't want other players to be successful. It, if they're not that su- successful, your favorite player is not going to be as good as he is right now. Because these players push each other to their limits so i really enjoy players going toe to toe against each other uh, it's i think it's when basketball as its best yeah it's really exciting to watch when they the one two bigs clash against each other that that's the best part of basketball in my opinion yeah that's it for me today uh, i know you guys are very excited to talk about social dilemma i had a chance to watch it I, I couldn't finish it i have 15 to 20 minutes left but i'll try my best to contribute to you guys's conversation all right thanks awesome i mean we're really excited because um we're both studying computer science so it's kind of in our alley uh rejeb you're doing um cyber security right uh yeah i'm actually choosing between software development and cyber security both of those fields really interest me and i'm happy to do both uh hopefully i'm gonna do development after oh, luck. yeah yeah the the thing about social dilemma um let me just give a brief summary of what it is it's basically former 
uh, developers and engineers coming together. Um, it's basically former engineers and developers coming and exposing all the exploitations of the uh, tech industry. So you see uh, former Facebook developers, Instagram developers, twi Twitter developers, and all those people in Google. Um, and no. the, point, the point they make in the beginning is this. Um, normally, social media was created as a tool, you know, for people to come together and socialize, right? But then after a few years, it became uh, an exploitation machine, basically. You know, it was no longer about people socializing. It was about how can we get our clients to be addicted and see as much ads as possible. You know, it turned more into this social movement um, to marketing, to profit. That's what it turned into. Not only the engineers and developers, there were also some vice presidents too, right? Of companies, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For example, Pinterest, uh, the, even the vice president of Pinterest, like the former vice president, he was even talking about how, uh, like, in... A certain type of way how evil uh, Pinterest is the um I, the main focus that they were trying to say is um, uh, if social media were to continue as a tool for socializing it wouldn't be too de so demanding because tools don't demand anything for you from you they just wait to be used and you use them um, there was a part about how the AI system worked behind Snapchat. I mean, I'm sorry, Instagram. So they show you the blueprints, okay? This is how it works. Um, so you scroll through images, okay? And it calculates how many seconds you stop on that picture. And they give you your ads according to whatever you stopped on. Yeah, it just builds like a database, right? It builds like a model. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, a quote um, from one of the old developers was this. They said, if these platforms aren't demanding a product from you, you are the product. Dude, that's scary. That's, yeah, if definitely. you think about it, it's really frightening because like these companies are just so big. Even in the documentary, one of the, like, one of the developers was saying like, there's no shut off switch. Even if you do shut off all these social medias, all the stockholders and the shareholders will just sue the company outright. And it's basically impossible to shut these machines down, like these uh, applications down. So like these these social media tools just growing at this exponential rate, is it's just scary to think about. Absolutely. And it's not only about getting people addicted, okay? There's this whole political side too. So they proved that according to wherever you live in the United States, your Google searches are manipulated. They manipulate your searches according to what you want to see. So for example, uh, in a more liberal and democratic state, once you write um, global warming, the suggestions are like global warming um, threats. How can we get rid of this? Blah, blah, blah. You go down to the most more conservative in Southern states, the, the suggestions become like global warming isn't real, hoax, blah, blah, blah. Um, that I think we should be more scared about that. Yeah, because like uh, in the documentary, it was also talking about basically whatever company gives the most money to like uh, applications such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, they're the ones that control the ads and they could just shape like millions of people's perspectives on things according to what those companies want people to believe. For example, in elections, what the, they want people to vote for. Can I just make a little quick suggestion? Um, you know, just we talked about basketball, two great players, you know, we said just enjoy those two. But in social media, you cannot enjoy both. Uh, there's two different sides. And you have to choose one of them and you have to hate the other. So it's really polarizing. You cannot come together to common ground. You have to be absolutely uh, don't don't agree with uh, others that don't 
think same as you. So I think that's one of the biggest problems for the politics. Definitely, stuff. bro. Um, like this is how the ladder works. The more you have to climb, the more you have to pull down the ones ahead of you. And like the two biggest parties in our country are like polar opposites. They're not even close. Yeah, even like the there's some smaller parties that have like a blend of both of them for people that actually like the Democratic and the Republic parties. And like they don't even appear on TVs. They don't even appear on advertisements or anything like that. Definitely. You know what really scared me? So with the current generation, um, so not even us, like us, I, I um, discovered what internet was when I was 11 years old. Okay. So we were introduced to internet and social media and all that so late and we're extremely addicted. So what really concerns me, okay. And they mentioned this in the documentary are kids platforms like YouTube kids. These, um, how can I say this? So even though we were exposed at such a late age comparing to compared to this generation, we're still extremely addicted. Now, the children that grow up today are conditioned in these small dopamine rushes at the age of five, six. So I really don't want to imagine them in the future. Exactly. Like I go home. Uh, I don't live with my parents. And even when I go home, I have a seven year old brother. He's making YouTube videos at seven years old. I don't even know like how to how to even do like a Google search until I was seven. You know, it's, it's scary. Um. We live at such a technological age where, you know, we have access to almost anything we want. I mean, there are a lot of pos- there are lots of positives to this, but um, I'm just seeing children just stuck to their screens for hours. I mean, it's almost like a, a getaway for parents because the, the, ch- the child gets addicted to the screen and they can just do whatever they want. But I think this is going to turn into a calamity. The thing is... The child doesn't make noise, so the parents don't have to uh, take care of the child when because they have so much stuff and they don't want in anything extra. And it's it's like a pacifier for the babies. And they turn a blind eye uh, for this addiction. Yeah, it's like a pacifier. You just give the phone to them and they shut up. Definitely. Well, 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 parent yeah. wouldn't want that. You just give them the phone and they be quiet. Bro, the thing is, uh. When these children have this rushing dopamine addiction, what are you going to replace it with? You can't. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because like you mentioned, you just condition at such a young age. It's it's impossible. So I was listening in uh, another podcast. It's called Crazy Genius. And they were talking about, you know, how drugs and alcohol is there are rehabilitation centers for addictive people for those stuff. Uh, they were talking about in future, probably we're going to see a rehabilitation center for internet addiction and that kind of stuff too. Like a technology technology rehab, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Bro, these already exist in countries like Korea and Japan. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, I, I watched like a short YouTube documentary on this. They literally have rehab centers for computers. The thing is, we're like the not the generation, but the general population is just even right now. We're so like as a whole, we're so addicted to these applications, electronics, technology that even when the truth is put out in front of us with these forms of documentaries and articles and everything, we don't even stop it. Like, for example, say you're uh, there's a certain type of fruit and all of a sudden uh people start like doctors and everything medical profess uh, professionals they start writing articles saying hey uh this fruit is actually bad for you uh it's gonna cause a certain illness for example just random illness uh, cancer or whatever and generally people would automatically just stop eating that but you don't see the same thing happening with these technologies such as instagram snapchat twitter we, we, we're still continuing it, continuing it, even when the truth is out there in front of us, telling us how addictive they are. Well, definitely. It's like, it's about addiction. Like we said, like, um, I'm pretty sure alcoholics know the harms of alcohol when they're drinking. They're just addicted. They can't stop. 
What's so ironic is that we watch this on Netflix. Yeah. And they do the exact <laughs> same thing. I don't know. Like, we're like, even the ecosystems where we're getting this information is, is addictive. Uh, I think a lot about that too. You know, we know the bad things about Instagram, YouTube, or any other social platforms on, again, social platforms. I think it's a paradox. Um, but it also makes me think that if used correctly, these platforms are not that bad. Uh, I'm not going to say they're uh, innocent, but the thing is, you know, the human, we cannot stop ourselves. Something has to stop us. I think that's why it's addiction. If we can stop, I don't see a lot of problems using these social medias and any other platforms. I completely agree. The main issue is this. It's the business ethics. You know, if it wasn't so focused on profit and addiction, uh, this wouldn't have gotten out of hand. But, I mean, all almost all these big companies are just focused on, one, street screen addiction, two, profit. Yeah, and it may be a little off topic, but as you mentioned, we are the product product to our advertisers. You know, it first happened in 1870s. There was a newspaper based on subscription base and they were like uh, a dollar each day's paper and some young man came up with an idea to make the newspaper like five cents compared to a dollar but he filled the newspaper with ads so that's where facebook and other companies get their ideas first so maybe wow. if we can make it like um, i don't know sub subscription based uh, make these platforms subscri subscription based so we don't see that much of ad and they don't have to try so much to keep us on screen watching and doing stuff i don't know i really have not very much very good ideas but i hope some people are thinking about it because uh, it doesn't look good <laughs> man i feel like even if you do make it subscription based at this point it's just going to bring more revenue to those companies which are uh, going to enhance their algorithms to collect data because people are just so addicted right now. They're going to pay that $30 no matter what. So I guess it comes back to the ethics problem as Yunus mentioned. Yeah. Their ethic committees needs to be more effective and uh, do a better job. What do you say, Jonah? I'm kind of hopeless. <laughs> I know that's pretty pessimistic, but I honestly have very little hope for the future when it comes to technological addiction. We're heading towards a dystopia. That's our only result, to be honest. We'll see. I mean, yeah, that like that's pretty much all I have to say. Again, I highly recommend um, everyone watching Social Dilemma and then canceling their Netflix subscription. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I was going to say. Recep, do you have anything? Uh, thank you, Jonah, for having me again. Uh, it was really interesting. Thank you, Rajab, for it coming. A, it was we a really nice to talk. Have you again some other time? Of course, I'll be glad to come. Uh, it was fun to talk to you both. Uh, hope to see you guys again soon. It was nice talking to you too. Awesome. Uh, I thank hope you. to talk to you about basketball again. It was really nice. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this week. Stay tuned, and see you next week.